I've been training for 30 years with the Taekwondo. Um, I'm a sixth degree black belt yeah, in the ITF style of Taekwondo because there's sort of two main, main bodies. I've won uh, some world titles and, <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> Again, me really put my neck on the line here. For me personally, I don't think there is much of a transition. I, I think it gives you a lot of body awareness. Um, so to be very good at pattern, I'm saying that, people that are very good at patterns can generally do all the techniques to spar. Whether they're good at sparring is a different situation, but they have that body control. Um, you know, but the actual blocking techniques you very see it, you know, it's not really often used in the sparring element of what we do. Yeah. Um, I have this big, huge guy, it was a Christmas pie who came out and my missus just dropped us off, just got the money out, a guy got thrown out of a pub. I was with one of my students who's massive and this big dude just came out and went straight for him because he'd been, he'd been thrown out of the pub. I just threw a big overhand right, cracked him straight in the head and knocked him out. So that, that was that sorted. And there was a lad out with us who did Taekwondo. Yeah. And he got into a little bit of a, an argument with somebody. Um, and you know how most people like, take their jacket off and step outside. This fucker took his jeans off <laughs> and went yeah, outside right. for a punch up. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video if you enjoy it and please subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Francis Miller. Francis, how are you, mate? Not too bad at all. Good, good to have you on, mate. So we've had a number of different martial arts. Obviously, you're a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt as well. Yep. But in addition to that, you are a striking martial artist, specifically Taekwondo and kickboxing. Yeah, that's correct. And we've covered a, a, a sort of array of different martial arts. So obviously, Jiu-Jitsu is the main one we chat about all the time. But we had Steve on chatting about karate, uh, Mike Rondi talking about wrestling. Um, a few other bits and um, we've not covered Taekwondo but it has come up on a couple of occasions <laughs> I've heard <laughs> <laughs> so I'm aware that there's lots of different federations different styles so it'd be great to get an expert's opinion or view on, on kind of I guess the state of Taekwondo and, and how valid it maybe is as a martial art yep. these days in real combat situations. So I'm familiar with uh, some of your credentials, mate, but could you explain to Danny your, your various belts and your accolades within Taekwondo and striking? Yep, so um, I've been training for 30 years with the Taekwondo. Um, I'm a sixth degree black belt uh, um, Yeah, in the ITF style of Taekwondo because there's sort of two main, main bodies. I've won uh, some world titles and, <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> well, that sounds like a big head. Um, so yeah, I've just, just come out from Kazakhstan, won the world championships out there in the sparring element. Obviously there's different disciplines within Taekwondo. Um, and then um, when I was 17, I won the men's world in a different association. So yeah, I turned 17, competed in the men's and won that, yeah, 2000. Amazing. So despite uh, that kind of not wanting to boast, and it's not a boast, it's just a fact, you you are a, a two-time world champion then? Yeah, yeah, two different associations, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. brilliant. And you do um, sort of patterns as well, or is it just sparring? Yeah, so I guess the thing that makes Taekwondo Taekwondo is the pattern side of things, so the set routines and movements, what you would use to progress through the belts primarily, and then you have sort of the, the sparring element that we do, board breaking, uh, special technique, which is like long flying kicks and things, uh, and then all those disciplines are also then done in like a pattern, uh, sorry, in a team format as well. Okay, perfect. And as I mentioned, you were a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt. Yep. I think you've been training for about 10, 9 years Yeah, nine, nine, ten years. Yeah, it's getting, yeah. getting that way, yeah. Yeah, perfect. And do you have a, a belt in kickboxing as well? I do, yeah. So that's sort of like the long trouser style kickboxing. So basically a very similar to the, the ITF Taekwondo style. I've, not, I've never heard of that before. No? Never heard of belt so the American, system. Yeah, so the American sort of kickboxing style, sort of uh, Joe Lewis back in the day, um, yeah, it's not so popular now. Obviously, with the like, K1 Thai style, um, it's not not as as known, I guess. But it was, yeah, they have graded systems uh, through that. Yeah, oh, okay. nice. And then, in addition to being a competitor yourself, you're also a coach as well. Yeah. Can you tell us about your martial arts academy? Yeah, so um, I run a club up in Taunton, uh, Evolution Martial Arts. We've got about 275 students at the moment doing a mix of the Taekwondo kickboxing and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, within that, sort of the, the main bulk of it is Taekwondo students. Um, I've got a few students have gone on to represent England. One of my students, she's three times European champion. Uh, the recent world, she came second, losing to North Korea in the finals uh, by one point. So it's a super, super close decision. But yeah, it's good. Good experience. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so... Sounds like you know a little bit about Taekwondo then, huh? A little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. So let's start with, with Taekwondo then. So, so what is it? So explain Taekwondo in a nutshell for us. So Taekwondo is a Korean martial art of self-defense invented by a, a chap called uh, General Che Hong Hai. Um, and that's basically it in a, in a nutshell. It's basically a Korean martial art, like a Korean form of karate. I'll get, I'll get killed for saying it like that, but <laughs> that pretty much is, it is what it is. It's sort of... Um, 
the chap invented it sort of, I think he, I believe he got sort of brown belt or second degree black belt in Shotokan karate during the sort of Japanese occupation and then wanted something for the Korean people and then created Taekwondo basically. Is that any different? In any way? Uh, yes, they're, they're completely different in regards to the the patterns and things. So yeah, they're the katas that they have in karate and the taekwondo have what we call tull. Um, but there's very, there's a lot of similarities in regards to like, the stance that they create. Um, yeah, they look, you could, I guess the untrained eye, they'll look very, very similar, but the actual routines, I guess, are completely different. Okay. And then in regard to like, that's kind of katas, so patterns, I guess. Yeah. In regard to the actual sort of sparring or, or, or sort of combat, is that different in regard to like the style of kicking, the style of punching, are the things that you can and can't do in the in the, in the two? Yeah, so um, we can't sweep in ITF Taekwondo. All kicks are done above the belt. Um, there's no grabbing, no knees, no elbows. So hence why I said like the long trouser kickboxing is very similar in that style. So it's basically kicking and punching. Um, and obviously the, over the years where the rules have changed, um, points, the scoring levels have changed. Um, in regards to how it compares to karate, obviously I'm not an expert in karate, but I've watched a bit and I've even watched Steve in the past um, when we've, we've worked together. Um, it seems to be more of like a point stop style where they hit and stop. Whereas ITF took on like a continual round. So we do like uh, two two minute rounds and then the winners decided and you move into the next sort of yeah. next part of the competition yeah perfect I know uh, I'm just thinking about um, obviously Joe Rogan who's yep. a very uh, well known podcaster and comedian among other things obviously he's got a taekwondo background yep. um, and there's been a couple of um Clips. I don't know if you've seen them. Where well, he's, he's kicking a bag. Yeah, he's, well, he's kicking someone's face. Oh, not seen that. No. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen the bag, and yeah, I've seen him kicking the bag. Not. Yeah, so there's a really old shot of him where he was competing, and he yep. did like a spinning back kick and hit no, some guy straight no. in the chin and just laid him out. Yeah. Um, so that that's quite impressive because I, I see about you obviously with competition, you've got the sparring, you've got the patterns, um, and then you've got the different rule sets that we'll get onto in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But. Yeah, I think one thing that's always really impressed me with Taekwondo is the the, the, the kicking ability and the, the dexterity and the yep. flexibility. Um, I mean, is that is that like a fundamental part? Is it sort of flexibility and, and those sort of really flashy high kicks? Yeah, I think like the rules, you know, kicking's kicking's punching's punching, isn't it yeah. really? And then depending on what rule set you fight under will depend on how many points you score or you know what the end goal is mm. of each technique. So where ITF Taekwondo is not about knocking people out, it's about scoring points. You score more points if you land kicks to the head. Okay. Uh, you land more points if you do a jump kick to the head. You land even more points if you do a jump spinning kick mm -hmm. to the head. So it sort of pushes the the game in that direction. Yeah. Um, and then then that sort of puts questions to it's like, uh, you know, can you use it in self defence? But obviously, the sports side of things is completely different. Mm. You, know, you wouldn't do spinning kicks in self defence. Mm. You know, but but the kicks themselves work. And it, I guess for a spectator, it becomes more engaging to watch when people are doing different things rather than sticking to win a fight through a simplistic game plan, which is perfect and will transcend like even from self-defense to like the, the, the sport element. Um, so yeah, I think setting a game plan, you know, with us, if we're down by a few points, it, the, it may be a last ditch effort to chuck out a spinning kick to the head because mm. we'll score more points. Um, so yeah, there's a definite emphasis towards kicking. Yeah, there's, yeah. You know, we score well, more. So you, you emphasis, the emphasis is towards kicking, not punching. Um, yeah, so there's a, again, there's been recent rule changes where you have to throw, you can only throw two punches and then you have to kick or disengage uh, to make okay. it more kicking based. It has gone in that way. Do you think that's a good or bad thing? Personally, I don't like it as much. <laughs> they, should, they should let a few more punches go, but the rules are the rules. But then that also makes you sort of diversify and as a coach, it makes me have to strategize how we're going to put combinations together. So it keeps it fresh in some ways, but you know, you can get stuck in your old No, no, you said it was uh, points. How hard are you allowed to hit someone? Pretty hard. Yeah, the, I mean, like the goal isn't to knock them out, so they should be controlled to the technique. How, how can you how can you control those sort of kicks, though, <laughs> to a point of not, if you're going to connect, it must be hard to take some off because to, to, to do the technique, you have to go all in, really, don't you? Yeah, you've got to commit to it. So, yeah, there's, I've been, I've been knocked out in competitions yeah. um, and... I had the person that hit me hasn't been DQ'd. It's my fault for not blocking it, sort of things. I walked onto the shot. Okay. Like I said, is that winding up and trying to swing a big shot would be frowned against. Where if you throw like a nice clean, like two straight punches and they land, it's and, and you get knocked out, it's not so frowned upon. Okay. Um, but like I said, yeah, the end goal is not to knock them out, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah. I've said before that it's like when you, when you spar, you, you do want to hit them as hard as you can. 
and then hopefully not knock them out in the process. Uh, <laughs> Still, oh, they got a good chin on them. Yeah, I was yeah, going to yeah, say, like, it's, 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 if you've got a shit chin going to Taekwondo, <laughs> you win everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just let them knock you out all the time and keep going through. And you'll keep going through the rounds, yeah. But, but if you get knocked out, you then can't continue yourself either. Oh, all right. So there's a real, like, yeah, yeah. you've then... Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Which isn't necessarily good for the safety of the sport in some ways. You know, you, you, you get hit really hard. There's, you know, you don't have, like, a standing eight count or ten count you know you're, you can take as long as you need and then go back and compete which I think is something they need to look out of in the rules mm. um, oh, that's mad isn't it you know it, it yeah. is mad but that's <laughs> the same with a lot, a lot of the semi-contact stuff that does happen people get hit they have time to recover whereas they would have been longer than 10 seconds if they you know if it doesn't look too bad they'll be then let to continue to spy so yeah yeah but even in that sort of football and especially rugby now there's been a lot sort of around that where people get knocked unconscious mm. or not even completely knocked unconscious, but yeah. take a head blow. Exactly, yeah. And then they're normally better said than done then. You yeah. know, even in a sport like football where obviously there's a bit of heading of the ball, but no real collision or contact yeah. is, is part of it. So, yeah, probably doesn't need looking at. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then um, I guess another comparison would be something like Muay Thai. So that, when I think about striking arts, sort of kicking striking arts, that's where my little bit of experience yeah. really lies. Um, even when I was doing the MMA, you know, I use a sort of Muay Thai style of kicking. Yep. Yeah. And I remember with that, you know, a lot of the kicks were obviously lots of leg kicks, so different because it's below the waist. Yep. Obviously, head kicks and midsection kicks as well. But a lot of the techniques in tie boxing, why I really liked it actually was because it was like really power based. Yep. Um, and I don't know if this is still the case, so don't quote me on this, but I believe the, the rules in tie boxing, yeah, certainly with the punching, is if you were to land a shot um, and didn't move someone's head in the, in the impact, it doesn't score. So you need to actually snap the head back yep. with the impact to score. Um, and that was what I really liked about it. Um, very different to amateur boxing as well, which is you know, a bit flicky and yeah, yeah. Just, just touching people with the, the white part of the glove. So it sounds like with Taekwondo, it's it's more about just landing that contact opposed to, to really kind of getting a, a reaction from the opponent. Is that Yeah, fair? yeah. It should be a clean technique. If the yeah. technique's not performed correctly, it shouldn't score. So it's not to say that things, you know, things hit, but because the technique's weak, they don't score it basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, yeah. It has to be a, a quality technique to score. Yeah, okay. And what led you into Taekwondo back in the day, mate? Because obviously there are a lot of options around striking arts. Yeah, I mean, about 30 years ago, not so much. So oh. growing up in a small town, like a, a place called Chard, there was basically, I think, a judo club, a karate club, and a Taekwondo club. And it happened to be my best mate's dad run the Taekwondo club. <laughs> so that that's basically how I fell into it. You know, as a kid growing up, watching the karate kid and all that stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, the competition element of that is what really inspired me. I wanted to be a part of that. Um, but yeah, there wasn't really huge selection. You know, like the same with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, 10 years ago, it wasn't as readily available as it is now. So that exponential growth. Uh, and now it's sort of in every town, multiple clubs, where it was only a few years ago, there was like one club here, one club there. You know, initially I started off driving down to Cornwall to train from Taunton. Um, and now, like, yeah, there's, there's clubs all the way between that. Yeah, where were you heading down to in Cornwall? It was Rafael de Santos. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on, guys? This episode is sponsored by Eden Clinic for Men, who specialise in men's health and male hormones. The details are on the screen now and in the description below. Head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test. Select EDP, which is the everyday perspective to get yourself a discount. In addition to male hormones such as testosterone, these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2, heart health, liver function and kidney function. The clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13, where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones, such as low mood, low libido, fatigue and weight gain. So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change and it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about guys, otherwise we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on fellas, so get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. Okay, cool. Um, so in regard to competition, then, let's, let's understand that a bit better. So you've just explained, I guess, the scoring. Yeah. Um, but can you just talk us through, I guess, the structure of tournaments, um, maybe the different associations? Obviously, with jiu-jitsu, we know it's typically, it's, it's, again, it's changing, as you say, but it, it historically was just a, a sort of bracket competition, knockout, and then you're done, um, and you work yep. your way through to a final. Is that similar? Um, so we have a 
table system so very much like football so you have your initial draw your initial table that you have to win and then you go through to a knockout phase after that okay. so you get you know a few fights to, to compete in if you win your group you then go through and then you go through the pyramid system uh, and then hopefully get through to the finals yeah um, yeah so it's pretty and not always done at national level as well sometimes national is just a straight pyramid system to the final but international currently that's the that's the process mm -hmm. there are rumours of going to a repsar system moving forward yeah, okay. uh, which I would I think is better to be honest yeah can you explain that for people that aren't familiar with that type of system what the repsar system mm -hmm. so basically if you, I think the the one that we're going to do or they're planning on doing is the one where if you lose to the eventual winner or second place you will then go through to compete for third place mm -hmm. I think that's that's it yeah yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting system that I kind of like it because it in many cases, they use it in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu a fair bit because it, it often guarantees people two fights. Yep. So it's nothing worse. I think um, one of our guests talked about it, Jamie, yeah. where you yeah. kind of like travel abroad or wherever and you lose your first fight, come home. Yeah. Um, whereas at least with that sort of system, yeah. there's an opportunity. If you do lose and you know, you're a slow starter, you could still, even if you don't win a medal, there's still an opportunity to potentially have a couple more bouts. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I think that's why they introduced the, the table element before that. So you travel all from you know, all over the country, all over the world, I should say, yeah. and you, you lose first round, you're out, and you've just spent thousands of pounds to get to this event to be out first round. Um, so at least in the table, you do get multiple fights, but at the same time, it's not... It's not always beneficial to the, the guy that's top of the group to go to picking up injuries on the way through. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, in the group, the tables aren't always even numbers. It should be four or three, and that's not always the case. So if you are, you know, you have your eight going through to the, the next phase, it could be the best loser goes through, or well, the best loser is only going to be from the group of four people, not the group mm -hmm. from three. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they try their best to, to run the events to the best of their ability, and it's a method. I, I personally, I think the reps should be better because the best people hopefully get through to the medals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can also get a bad draw on a table and not make it through. So, mm. yeah, no, the rep size, I'm hoping that comes in the next few years. Yeah, no, that's quite an interesting way to do it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think certainly if you're trying to gain experience, um, that's really good. Um, and then in regard to, um, I guess, you know, sort of weight brackets, like what are, what are the weight categories? Yep. Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. I should know that as a coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, depending on their, their age, um, so they start from um, 11 to 13 for the youngest kids categories. And that's what it's all done by height. And I think it's I think it's like starting from 30 kilos or 35. And yeah. It's every 10 kilo bracket. Is it okay? Um, the men's are, I think it's seven kilos sort of divided in the brackets yeah. down to sort of like high 50 kilos yeah, okay. I, I should know that but not off the top no of that's head. fine I, mate. I, I didn't mean exact number no, no, it's just, yeah, uh, so just a rough rough gauge and did you just say that um, 11 to 13s were the youngest yeah that's the youngest so you can't compete until you're 11 uh, so you, you can compete at national level but international you can only compete from 11 right, at, okay. at European level not at world level yeah. world level is 14 plus okay and then um, obviously with Jiu Jitsu again I then I use this reference a lot because it's all I really know no, these fine. days um You've obviously got, I don't know, the Devon Open. Yep. So a sort of local, regional event. And then you've got your, I don't know, sort of British Open, yep. um, which is sort of IBJJF um, affiliated normally. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Europeans and Nationals. Um, and then outside of that, you've got obviously, you know, so your variations, so the ADCC um, and, and different sort of maybe no-gi or, or submission-only type competition. So can you explain how, what the, what the sort of... Um, what the landscape looks like for taekwondo competition you mentioned already sort of national internationals how does that work yeah i mean so yeah you have you have the local ones that are just local clubs up a, a national sorry a, a regional event um the national events are generally ran by the ngbs by the national governing bodies uh, and then that's what's generally used to help with the selection for the international team so you know it starts off just yeah compete national level and then go to the ne um, sorry yeah, sorry local level then go to the national level, and then from there work into the international stage. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of different Taekwondo associations, so you could probably find a Taekwondo competition nearly every weekend if you wanted to. But it's not necessarily all part of the, the same group. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's you know, it gives you opportunity to compete against different people. Mm -hmm. So I see that's a positive, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely good. So tell us about now you're warmed up a little bit. Tell us yeah. about your recent uh, world title. <laughs> so t tell us about <laughs> no. kind of where that was. You know, the the, the kind of journey to that. Yeah. Talk us through some of the bouts and. Yeah, so um, 
like not for me personally, my journey through ITF Taekwondo has been sort of quite checkered. I've been, you know, as you do, I joined this little club in Chard, followed my instructor for 20 years plus. Uh, he emigrated to Canada. And I sort of just sort of left out there, not sure where to, where to go. Um, then an opportunity came up to join a group that had access to the ITF Taekwondo, which I knew of, but not really didn't know much about it. Um, and I'd competed outside of that massively. I'd been, you know, competing in all the national circuits, won numerous sort of national titles, um, and a few a few international titles against, but but not in the main governing bodies. So when we joined the ITF, I hadn't achieved anything within that group. Um, I got involved and started coaching at the, the England level, um, and then was waiting to turn forty because at that point that was the age bracket to compete in the the, the veterans, as it was. Uh, I knew I was too slow for the seniors, it's like the the speed and the, they're so dynamic I thought I just I'm, I am just too old a few too many injuries um, so then turn 40 thought right, I'm going to start training and go to Kazakhstan uh, if I get into the team that is um, yeah turn 40 they changed the rule to be a veteran for 35 so I was then slap bang in the middle of the category <laughs> which was really frustrating I competed at the um, UK Open uh, sorry I competed at the English Championships I came third I won a medal I ended up losing to a guy who ended up winning the European Championships um, a guy called Alan Rafferty uh, also trained Brazilian Jiu Jitsu up in Scotland um, I, think he's, I think he's a brown belt recently as well but anyway so um, yeah competed against him he went on to win the Euros and I thought Do you know what I, I felt good against him mm. I feel that I can get back involved so yeah trained for the rest of the year um, and then flew out to Kazakhstan in, in September and then, yeah, um, like I said, I, uh, first round I drew Mongolia, which is probably my hardest competitor out of all of them, to be fair. He was just awkward the way he sparred. He kept doing some weird stuff that made me second guess myself more than anything. Um, but yeah, I think I beat him in the last four seconds. So the, he was winning the whole fight and then just got a nice little exchange and at the end flipped the score. Uh, then I fought against the current European champion in my weight class at minus 85 uh, from Albania. Uh, and then again, compared to the Mongolian, I found him a lot more predictable. I'd watched a little bit more of his video footage uh, and just played a real simple, clean game. There's nothing too complicated. Again, I, I like simple, you know, high percentage sparring for me. Uh, then the finals was against uh, USA. Um, and yeah, big tall guy, long sort of rangy kicks. Again, very awkward in the way he sparred, but just, you know, took the lead, held the lead and then put the pressure on them to attack me and then mm. pick them off as they, as they came in. Um, so yeah. And that was it. And then mm. came off the mat and Percy didn't really get as much elation as I felt I was going to get and decided to, that's me, I'm done now. I'm retired, retired, get, 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 get out. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Fair enough. Much. And, and with, um, with those sort of international tournaments, can you just, can you just enter um, or do you need that's to be- That's a really good question. No, you have to, have to be selected. So um, yeah, so you have to make the national standard to go through to the international competitions. That's not the same for all Taekwondo associations. Um, so, but yeah, with ours, with, with the official ITF, uh, which will, again will get me slated for saying that because, as I said earlier, <laughs> there's there's multiple associations, but ours ours by law is the the official group. There's a few other groups that run very very similar to us in regards. To you have to be selected to compete, uh, but there are other associations that any man and his dog can turn up and enter, okay. um, which don't hold so much credibility. Mm. And do you, do you like are you part of like a sort of GB or England team when you do so that? Part, yeah, part of the England team. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the England team runs the squad sessions out of Swindon currently. Um, but yeah, like I said, I've been coaching with the England team for about ten years now, I think. Um, and yeah, it's. Yeah, stepping so into the international, so you have to you have to compete at the squad training as well as compete nationally to be selected to mm -hmm. to get into the international team. Yeah, and who um, who makes a selection of who gets to join that team? So the coaching staff. Yeah. So yeah, they look at past results and how they've got on, yeah, and then and even if they've won the national competition, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go through mm -hmm. to represent internationally because the standard internationally is so high. You know, there's the, the Korean, Russian, Ukrainian, Czech. Bulgarian teams are so so strong that you know it could be like a a, a lamb out to the slaughter if they compete at that highest level. And they, you know, just because they're winning here doesn't mean they're necessarily good enough. Yeah. Um, so there's a an element of control from the, the the coaches to keep everyone safe as well. Yeah. So with uh, just being a little bit controversial here, oh. so you mentioned that obviously your association is selection only. Yeah. And then there's others that anybody can just enter. Yeah. Um, and you said those ones are, are slightly less credible. Is there is there an argument to say that obviously if your face doesn't fit or if you're just not liked as a person, you wouldn't be selected for that group? And therefore, where you can enter, or anyone can enter, you might get 
a, a wider range of competitor? Generally, no. The the, um, the coaching staff are very open to... We, we want to take the best people because obviously we're representing England as the coaching staff and we want our team to do the best. So the, the best people are always picked for the job personally. Um, but again, that, I mean, that could happen. Uh, there are World Cups within our association uh, where any man can go and enter, but they're sort of, again, they're like a tier down from the, the World Championships. In my opinion, that may not be seen that way, but yeah, the World Cups are one level down from the actual official World Championships where you have to qualify. Um, but yeah, no, it's a good it's a good point. But yeah, I think we we, we cover that pretty well. Mm. Um, again, we you know because there could be associational bias as well as you know you know just don't get on with the person. But we try and put that aside. We want to take the best team. So obviously, and also the individuals make up the team as well in regards to. So we have our individual categories, and then after you've done all the individual um, events, you then go and compete in the team events. So you'll compete in the team sparring, team patterns, team power, team special technique. So again, we want the best team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, makes sense. And with obviously sparring, which you've just kind of explained, and then you've got patterns. Yeah. Do you do both or do you just do one? So I, I do both, yeah. Okay. I do the power. I didn't do very well at the power at the world. What's, so. Can you explain the differences between power and everything else? So power is basically these big, hard plastic boards and you have to put your fist, your... I, um, for, so for the veterans, it's um, that's, that's a lie, it wasn't fist. It was uh, your, your knife hand, the blade of your foot or the ball of your foot. And then normally... so. You, they're the tools that you can use to break the boards, but you can use any technique. Uh, so like um, a turning kick would be, um, as you throw the kick, you'd use the ball of the foot to hit the board to break. A side kick, you use the blade of the foot, like the heel side of the, the foot. And then your your knife hand is like the this part of the foot, the, the foot, sorry, the hand that you sort of judo chop it. <laughs> proper uh, Bruce Lee proper shit. Proper Bruce Lee <laughs> And then depending on the technique, you, you add multiple boards and yeah, it's, pretty savage when it doesn't break like when it breaks it's awesome it doesn't hurt at mm. all but when it doesn't break all that force is going somewhere and it generally means through your through your fist your hand and something's going to get broken in the process yeah have you had many injuries through the breaking not so much but i've seen loads of people I've done, um, the euros are in croatia like one of the women she did the knife hand strike and broke her forearm like doing it wrong oh. there's loads of broken hands it does, yeah it's not so what's the, what's the point of it? Demonstrate technique and efficiency of technique. Um, you know, if you can break those boards, it means you have the potential to hit someone hard, but mm -hmm. the old adage, you know, boards don't hit back. Yeah. It's true, but if they, if they do hit you, you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's interesting because, again, we, we touched on it earlier where I asked if it's just about landing that, you know, just touching, you know, a bit of skin on skin, a bit of stroke of the face with the foot. But if, you, if you're breaking boards as well. Yeah, and I think that's probably why they do it. Yeah. You know, so... We don't hit. We control our technique when we spar, but our power is to demonstrate that our techniques have force and yeah. could cause damage if, if used. Yeah. I'm like you know the 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 psychic qualifies about four boards, okay. which is like equivalent to sort of four inches of wood. Um, I bounced straight off it. And, you know, it was a pretty pretty howling attempt for myself at the worlds, but but yeah, I mean, and it goes up to five boards. So if you break everything, you then add more boards, or you do yeah you mm. random techniques, and it is impressive to see. Yeah, um, yeah, the, yeah, it's a. Uh, is there someone who stands out who's like silly good at it? it just gets like yeah. So in our bang. association, the Mongolian team are really good at power. I remember one year we were competing in England as a team. We're doing quite well, and Mongolia were nowhere to be seen. And it came all to the power events, and they just I think they ended up like fifth in the medal table. They won all the gold medals, and they were just yeah <laughs> a phenomenal team for for power. Mm. Yeah, very good. And how about the the sort of equivalent for sparring? Who's looking the who's the best nation? Uh, North Korea currently okay. they're. They are they're the last event. They are phenomenal. That's not always been the case. Um, so for us, it's probably Korea, Russia, uh, Ukraine, and then um, Czech Republic, Bulgaria. Sort mm -hmm. of the, the, where I'd sort of roughly put the, the rankings. I guess, I guess, yeah, Mongolia, based on the medal table. Yeah, for sparring, though, no, those few countries. Yeah, they're very, yeah. very good. And then, uh, oh, I forgot Greece. How did I forget? Yeah, Greece, a phenomenal team as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And then uh, patterns. Patterns pretty much the same order to be honest those, okay. in, those international teams yeah, I mean I don't know how I forgot Greece that yeah Greece is like a powerhouse in Europe currently mm -hmm. I think it's because I'm trying to forget them because they cause us so much issues <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah no there's there's a few very very strong teams that have a lot of a lot of class um, the Greek a few of the Greek team came over to the UK Open last year and just completely dominated the field which was frustrating because it makes us realise our standards as England but we're pushing in the right direction we, you know we're you know and where, where are we? Where are we? So I think we came tenth overall in the world, uh, the, yeah. in the world standings. It's, um, not, too it's, not, too yeah, it's, it's not too bad. Yeah, it's yeah. not too bad at all. And again, it is truly an international competition. You know, there's so many countries there. So to hit the top, I think there was, there fifty countries in total. 
for the Worlds. So ending up top 10, not too bad mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, it's pretty good going, mate. Yeah. And then with, with, with patterns and the scoring on that, so I think with obviously sparring and breaking boards, it's pretty objective in regard to who's winning that. Yeah. With the patterns, it, it's, I'm assuming that would be more of a subjective judging thing? Yeah, pretty much. There's like a scoring, I don't want to say matrix, that you get trained as an umpire, and then the umpires are looking for common common mistakes if the stances aren't done in the correct manner, mm. um, if the blocks and techniques are the wrong section, uh, and then you you lose marks basically through the process yeah. of that. Is yeah. it like a like a dance, like yeah, choreography? It is, is choreography. It like, yeah, is it just that? It's just yeah, a set that. routine of movements performed against an imaginary opponent. Is the <laughs> is the yeah. this real? Yeah, that's that's what we're doing. And uh, but I think this is and karate is the same, isn't it? As well with the, with the cutters, but. That, that's almost the bit that people see and laugh at. Yeah, hundred percent. Do you like how important are those movements and those movement patterns to actual transfer to combat or sparring? Yeah. So I, for me personally, I don't feel that is this is this is getting me really put my neck on the line here. For me personally, I don't think there is much of a transition. I, I think it gives you a lot of body awareness. Um, so to be very good at pattern, I'm saying that people that are very good at patterns can generally do all the techniques to spar. Whether they're good at sparring is a different situation, but they have that body control. Um, you know, but the actual blocking techniques, you very see, you know, it's not really often used in the sparring element of what we do. Um, but yeah, body awareness, body control. Um, and it, it takes a lot of effort to get good at patterns. But yeah, direct, like a real world transfer, minimal effect, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, okay. In my opinion. <laughs> Why do it then? Is, what, is it just tradition? <laughs> it's just the tradition of it. Tradition. The, 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 the 24 patterns that we, we go through basically mark each belt. So you have to be able to perform the pattern. And then if you can do it to an effective stand, you go up to the next level. And that's, yeah. But I do understand what people think. Oh, why do that? It's, um, I personally enjoy doing them. Um, I think like, regarding like mental health in like with jujitsu, getting crushed stop you thinking about anything other than someone trying to kill you in taekwondo you can do your pattern you haven't got time to think about anything else other than the move you're going to do next because you get lost in a sequence of movements that you can perform mm. so like it's that holds you know some weight just to be sort of forget where you are focus on what you're yeah. doing sort of that mind body mm. connection so yeah I, I enjoy doing them personally I do enjoy doing them yeah. there's too many of them but <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. they're very yeah, it's easy to, to forget and merge but then that's why the pattern champions they have to remember you know if they're migrate they've got to do 24 patterns you do one designated how, how long pattern how do they last for what, uh, when you say like yeah, that's good. in my head I'm like you know what what is it, is it what is a pattern what, yeah, yeah, yeah what is so it? like the lower grades color belt patterns I think the, the, the highest one's got like 38 movements so, so not not too massive uh, one of my higher patterns got like 72 moves and they go down so it's like a huge there's a memory element to it and it can become difficult to remember and also nuance of movement between certain techniques um, that the umpires will be looking to score you down on if you do it wrong so it's, it is hard and so you do like your, your designated pattern uh, and then you have your optional pattern mm. so you do the pattern that you've been practicing you compete with that and you go into the, against the same person the second round as a pattern they choose for you the, 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 um, the tournament like um, the, the jury president would select the pattern and that's a random pattern out of the one, you know, one to 24 basically. So it's a, it's a cognitively it's pretty challenging uh, and then to perform to a high standard, it's, yeah, it's hard work. Yeah, fucking hell. Yeah, that's tough. It reminds me of dance school, mate. That's all I think. Is, oh, you've been is, to dance school, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talia, Talia Conte, my sisters went there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the sparring, what do you think the key attributes are for someone to be like, doing well at a high level tall lean long reach and good flexibility i mean that would be if i was to like profile someone that's what i'd definitely look for um but but then saying that the the greek guys i wouldn't say they're all tall skinny and, and lean you know they've de designed their game they do like a lot of counter back kicks like um again you score more points with jump spinning kicks so they'll set their game around trying to set up their back kick to score hit and run and then reset the game um, which can be super frustrating because there's nothing you can do about it you know you've got to engage and attack them to score a point uh, they're so used to that that style that they'll, they'll hit you for back kick run they're up by three points you're now oh, going to chase fuck. three points so it's a run it's a nightmare when you go down yeah, yeah sneaky little fuckers they are <laughs> they're, good, they're good at it sneaky but also Greeks. it's minimal attribute as well yeah you don't have to be super flexible to do a a, a back kick really so actually it's like you know I, I see what the Greek team are doing I think there's a lot to be said for their their mindset you know setting a game plan around a 
so each individual just you know, can all fight that style and then if they have additional attributes they can then add that to their game yeah. so it's like a, a base place to work from is impressive it's got a lot of merit um, yeah I, personally I, I try and work with individual students with their own individual skill set you know that if you know I'm lucky enough to have like having a Katie, one the girl that's a European champion. She was never athletic, but she was super tough and resilient. So we just use the A game of pressure, 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 and just you know take a hit, but then keep giving two more. And then over the years, we finessed her skill set. She said to me, "I'm fed up of fighting like a heavyweight. I want to fight like a lightweight." Mm -hmm. So we then changed up her style of like hit and move counter game instead. Um, but yeah, and then tactically, that's, that's one of the things I love about Taekwondo. Like I said, the rule set and the changing is frustrating, but it then makes you, it challenges you to change and evolve your, your style of coaching. So it keeps, yeah. it, keeps it fun. Yeah, who's the GOAT? That's a great question. I was, I was literally thinking that a minute ago. I was like, who's, who's the best? Who's the best? Who is the best? Hmm. So there's, uh, there's, there's a few. I mean, over the years, it changes. Uh, Evgeny from Russia, phenomenal. Uh, sparring. Um, the Korean team, um, individual names, do you know, I couldn't actually tell you who they are. They just come in and they go. Uh, and then, but the, the multiple, it's actually hard to win multiple years back to back. Um, Krilov, another phenomenal Russian exponent. Um, Andre Kress, another Russian. Uh, there's a, yeah, there's, there's low, there's, there's quite a few. It's hard to pinpoint just one. Mm. Um, and, and I'd say like, ITF ta Taekwondo is quite young in regards to the people that win the events seem to be in youth is on their side. You see a lot of the juniors mm. now coming through into the seniors and winning the, winning the internationals within their first year of being a senior. So there's definitely a sort of that speed reaction game. It's definitely, whereas it used to be where we didn't have a two punch rule, you get and you just keep blasting away. And then until the, till they fell out of the ring or the ref stopped it, you know, you could win through more aggression. Um, whereas is now it's more tactical, mm. yeah, yeah. I guess more skillful. Okay, let's talk about rule sets because it it was something that Steve very briefly mentioned. Um, I think he mentioned about Olympic style. Yeah, um, how different that is to more traditional style. And you yeah, just yeah. mentioned something about the two punch rule there, and you I think offline you mentioned that even in the I think you said in the ITF there was a few different like, sort of styles or, or bits. Yep. So help us understand that a little bit better, mate. So like what what are the I guess what's traditional, what's Olympic, you know, what's better? What's your opinion? Yeah, so the I mean again, I'm definitely be biased. The ITF style for me is better because it is kicking and punching. There may be a limit on how many punches we can throw now. That is only within our ITF. Other groups still do the continual punching rule. Um but yeah, the, the Olympic style is with the body armor. That's full contact. Uh and they, they can punch, but they can only punch to the to the body armor itself. Uh, for me personally, watching it, I think where they haven't regulated techniques so well, you haven't got to do what you, you have to get your foot to the, the pad to score. Uh, and you can do that in any means. It doesn't, you haven't got to do a technical kick. You can flick the sole of your foot. As long as the sensor hits the sensor with enough force, it, it registers as a score. Um, where I think if they were to tidy up the techniques, it would be, you would see more of a, uh, maybe an appliable self-defense, whereas currently you can't I was about really to say, isn't, isn't Taekwondo, like every other martial arts, supposed to be a form of self-defense? So then if you're watering it down that much to then flicking each other, and it just seems a bit fucking fairyish to me. Yeah, I mean... Is that right to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I personally agree with that. I think, you know, they've got some phenomenal kickers, though. Like some yeah, of the, I, I'm, not, I'm not taking away from the skill aspect of it. I'm on about kind of like having the dog in them. You know, with jiu-jitsu, it you definitely got to have that dog in you a little bit to that keep, stay on the, yeah, pushing, stay on the yeah. mats and all that sort of stuff. And if Taekwondo is supposed to be a, you know, self-defense thing, and, yeah, yeah. and I know there's different aspects to it, you know, you've got the sports side, but underlying with all these martial arts, we're supposed to, it's supposed to be self-defense. Yeah, and it, I guess that maybe the tradition, and again, I don't do the Olympic style Taekwondo, the WT Taekwondo, um, and maybe there are traditions that have more of a self-defense element. I think mm. where the WT has now got that Olympic recognition, they all go in that route. So the, you know, yeah. it's, again, it's led by the rules. You know, the rules dictate the style uh, and coaches and competitors are going to push the rules to score the points to win yeah, yeah, it makes as sense. much as they can. Um, but yeah, I personally, I feel they should, there should be more regulation on how they score points, but that's not the way it's gone. Um, like within our, within our ITF, we now have a, a with the classes, a compulsory technique. So you have to do a minimum of one jump, 180 kick per round. And if you don't do that, you lose two points. Um, and I think it's to sort of draw, you know, spectators in to watch the game. So it, it, the matches, they look more exciting to watch. But 
we just throw them out quickly without any risk. <laughs> yeah. So look, you know, it doesn't really it doesn't really work. But it has it, again, it, it evolved the game. So now we had to set the game up, you know, to be able to throw a compulsory without leaving ourselves vulnerable to getting hit and countered ourselves. So it, became, it makes you more aware. Whereas before, if we didn't, and it was just like kick and punch, like a sort of kickboxing style, it would look like kickboxing. Um, so again, I am pro changing rules, but as long as technique is regulated, because again, you want it to look like a, it could apply and it could work. Whereas I feel maybe the, the Olympic style doesn't hold that for me personally. Is there any skill that will change? Uh, a, a, a simple rule change of regulating technique could change that. Yeah. Whether they will, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be going that way. Mm. But, but you know what? Even then, they've come up with some creative kicking, which, you know, I won't want to get hit with it. So, <laughs> so you know, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's my view on it and actually them evolving the rules will change things to improve their game eventually, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's... It's a hard one to sort of put my definitive. That's my opinion, but rule changes are sometimes good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. In regard to like Danny's comment around the self-defense thing, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's quite it's quite an interesting one because obviously jujitsu is quite good, providing you get your hands on somebody. Yeah, you can pretty much defend yourself against anybody. Um, years and years ago, I was out, out, out on the piss. And there was a lad out with us who did taekwondo. Yeah, and he got into a little bit of a, an argument with somebody. Um, and you know how most people like will take their jacket off and step outside. This fucker took his jeans off <laughs> and went yeah, outside right. for a punch up. Are oh, you fucking nice. joking? So he could kick the guy. Nice. And how did that go? Yeah, it went well for him. But did he kick him? In the <laughs> <laughs> booted him, mate. Yeah. Hey, oh, fuck but hell. but I mean, like, how bad? <laughs> <fuck, like, laughs> legendary. That is. Yeah. So we had these skinny jeans on, and he knew he couldn't kick this guy so with his jeans. Whipped them off. So yeah, in, in part of that, right? Get outside, whip the jeans off. <laughs> And went out and fought him in his fucking pants. The chap thought he was taking down the alley. That's what I thought. the poor guy for. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that doesn't seem particularly practical. And I know that's like, um, you know, a bit of a funny spin on it. But I mean, how effective do you think it is in, you know, in a, in a, in, 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 in a street fight defending yourself? I think for me, like if you understand timing and distancing, it all, like again, punching's punching, kicking's kicking. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's down to the individual coaches that teach it. Now, for me, a lot of people that teach Taekwondo don't have a background in competing have you know yeah i mean for me it's the competition background if you have that you know how to punch kick against someone yeah it's under a rule set but at least you understand the basic timing and distancing whereas a lot of instructors in taekwondo you can go through the ranks without being tested and you will get that black belt and then you can open up a school and then you will teach what you know which may be very limited um, which is which i think is a lot of the issue with, with taekwondo in general it's not it's just not regulated to have the best people teaching it but then will that happen with jiu-jitsu as well i'm sure it will i'm sure it's starting yeah i mean how old's taekwondo uh it's 1955 it, it started and i think in 19 uh 1965 it was in the uk so yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's not been around that long. Not. Not UK. really. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. The belt system. What's what is that the same as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? No. There, there's a, so you, you have your like white, yellow, green, blue, red, and then black, and then you have like a, a stripe grade or a tag grade between each of those belts. What? Just one. Just one tag. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And yeah. So it takes a, 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 approximately sort of three months per grade, and it's meant to be around six months for the sort of blue belt through to to black belt. But you're looking at sort of three and a half years to four years to be a black belt. So not not oh, huge, well, not a huge amount. Fast, really, yeah, yeah. It's relatively. Is it seems crazy? Crazy, crazy it seems that way. Like three or four years, yeah. Yeah. So when we had Steve on, actually, I think it was in that discussion. I no, I think it was when we were talking one to one. So there was a, a video that we did that blew up a little bit, and it was me talking about the belt system in jujitsu, and I was saying about how, you know, in jujitsu by its nature, you need to, you know, you, it's kind of awarded on application. Yeah. You know, if you know the techniques, but you can't apply them on anybody, then you're typically not going to get your belt. Um, and I might have mentioned, I might compare that to more traditional martial arts. I might have mentioned Taekwondo in that list. <laughs> um, and got, you know, got, it caused loads of controversy because awesome. That's obviously what you want, though, Jiu Jitsu it? people, yeah, absolutely. And then you've got traditional people saying, well, come and fucking fight me and I'll show you how much you're going to fight me. <laughs> but I mean, you just commented then about obviously it is watered down a little bit. And there are some instructors that can go through all the way to Black Belt, open their own schools without pressure testing. Yeah. Um, so can you can you explain like, the grading system and, and how you get your belt and then maybe how those individuals then somehow slip through? That's a good question. So basically yeah. gradings happen every three months and it should be then regulated by the instructor to say whether they're ready to go through or not. 
Do they have to pay for grading? Sorry. They do pay for yeah, gradings, yeah. And there's, a, there's normally a, a charge for the gradings. Um, so yeah, every three months is the grading cycle pretty much. And then if they're ready, they test and that's pretty much it. And because it's not just about, and I, and I do understand that because it's not just about the sparring element. You know, I've done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a while now. I competed as a, a blue belt and as a white belt and that's pretty much it. I haven't competed since. Um, so maybe I'm, you know, what I'm saying isn't you know, reflecting on what I'm saying about it. Maybe it isn't as necessary, but at the same, at the same time, um, I feel in regards to running a school, you need to have that that deeper knowledge, you know. So the the, the taekwondo for me the the competition bit is what's going to help transcend the self defence. So if you if you can't compete, you can't understand distance. The self defence element, just that grassroots. If you don't know how far to keep someone away from you, you're going to get cracked in the head. So the, so yeah, the grading's every three months, decided by the instructor if they're ready to go through. And I think maybe that's the that's the sticking point. Um, me personally, in my club, I'm. I don't make it so easy, especially for the juniors to get the black belt. I don't feel there's a rush, and got that a lot from the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I, I felt doing Jiu Jitsu where you know, as a as a blue belt or moving towards blue belt, you should be holding your own against the white belts and you know, people a bit bigger than you, and you can, you know, hold your you know perform the techniques against those people. And it made me reflect on the Taekwondo where that you know people get to black belt and then maybe start to get good if they stick with it for long enough, but they've got the black belt at that point. And for me, it was like it's the wrong way around. Mm. So we we slowed down our grading process for our juniors anyway. They have to do additional grading. So I get the thing that Taekwondo's done right is it has that progression, and people need that. Sadly, then people chase the belts, unfortunately. So I think again, if you say to guys, look, the the belt is where we want to aim for, but we want to be the best standard we can be at each individual level. You're going to raise the standard of your club. But I think too many people just let people grade through is the it, system. Is it the same as um, karate, where if they get a black belt as a child, they can then they're, they're a black belt, and yeah. they don't act like in jujitsu where they kind of go through the grades yeah, and then they start again, belt, don't they? Then yeah. Get to blue belt and then go yeah. through the adult system. It, so in taekwondo, you get it and that's it. Yeah, it. that's it. Yeah, once you get your black belt, you're a black belt. They have like junior black belts, so they have a black belt of a white stripe through to say that a junior. Um, but doesn't that 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 would water it down? Because like Paul, I think said on another podcast, like if you're if you're 15, 14 year old black belt and yep. then you're, you're not in it for 10 years and you think, ah, what can I do? And then you can open up a school doing taekwondo effectively. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you could do. Um, I think that's the only issue with it, isn't it really? Mm. If, if they if they had to re-go through it yeah. like you do with jiu-jitsu, I think it re-emphasizes their ability. And then you can and you, you find people that go back into jiu-jitsu at 16, 17, whatever, that you know they can still be a black belt at 20, but they have to still go back through those few belts just yeah, for yeah. maturity I imagine yeah. maybe Taekwondo in its infancy didn't look into the future mm. of like how many people are going to take it up you know at my club it's mostly kids that do Taekwondo yeah. the system is the system could you change that at your club if, or are you, are you not allowed so I I've changed the way in which I grade my students through the belts to mm. get to, so I've made the process to black belt um, more systematic and a, a better process I personally yeah. feel and I feel that our standards as a club has improved in the last few years because of that um but again, you could take that exact same system. And if you don't regulate it, it won't do a thing. Yeah. Um, also with the Taekwondo, black belt is seen as the start of your training. Uh, so I, in other martial arts, you see black belt as the, the pinnacle. And, mm. I, and I guess it, it is, but really it's actually meant to be the beginning. Everything before black belt was pre-training basically. And then yeah. as a black belt is where you refine your skill set. Um, you know, I guess you don't really think like coral belts in jiu-jitsu as the pinnacle. You just think yeah. of the black belt. But really you could argue that maybe, and yeah. as you hear from, I'm you know, not a black belt at all, but you hear about these black belt saying that when I got my black belts when I sort of restart to understand and mm. develop and improve it's literally what Bradley ever said he was world champion didn't he and he said I didn't feel like a black belt yeah mm. and I, I sort of get that do you feel like um, because people have to pay for grading do you feel like you're obliged to give them a stripe or a thing even if they haven't applied themselves as well as they should have I gen because I run my gradings, I just won't let them grade. So I guess you could say it's a guarantee pass if they do it, but I regulate that if they're not ready to grade. Ah, so you tell them in advance, say so you're, yeah, quite, you're quite not ready quite ready, for, you for need for to wait. Oh, but okay. that's so easy. Again, it's my you know it's my profession, so it yeah. makes a lot more sense for me to let everyone grade. But my moral compass won't allow me to. But I think that's why we're also growing as a club as well. We're getting bigger, we're getting stronger, and the, the team's getting stronger. So yeah. I think it's down to the individual. You know, if you yeah. don't have a yeah, what are you in it for? And they, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you yeah. know, if you. I want to create a legacy of a, a high standard club that will go on to the future, hopefully. But and some people maybe see a bit short term, also under pressure of a business. You're trying to run your school, you're trying to make a little. It's hard, you know, financially, it can be really, really difficult. So I get why people do it, but um, struggle with it personally. And I think as well for kids, they want that. They, they, it's a really, it's a, it's a real motivator for kids, isn't it? 
to get the next stripe, to get the mm. next belt. They don't really give a fuck about, you know, they want to be a black belt, but they don't really, they're not like adults where they really want to be a black belt for a certain reason to defend themselves to yeah, fight. Yeah. Kids, most of the time, it's, it's a hobby. It's yep. a bit of fun. They want to learn some self-defense, but really, they're chasing that next little stripe belt, stripe belt, mm. stripe belt, you know. The, the idea, the longer we keep them in the system, the more we can benefit their lives as well. You know, yeah. it's not necessarily always about the punching and kicking, you know, sometimes, you know, if we can get everyone doing a martial art, there's probably going to be less fighting because we're all sort of respectful of each other more so. And I think that's like the, the philosophy we're talking is sort of ge geared that way that if we, yeah, the more people we keep involved in, in the art, mm. the, you know. I think any martial art world peace that's level. legit is, yeah. is good for anyone, isn't it? For yeah. discipline and for fitness and yeah, for yeah, a bit of fun. That's the other thing people forget. It's actually yeah. fucking fun. And, yeah, you know what I mean? We put so much emphasis sometimes on this bollocks. Yeah, yeah. And the actual just turning up and doing it is way more fun than actually yeah. fucking worrying about belts and all that crap. You know what Literally I mean? the other day I was, uh, when I was training, I think on Monday or Tuesday yeah. whenever I was in, I was rolling with one of the lads. Yeah. And I was literally staring off over his shoulder. Yeah. Like grinning. And he, he, he stopped and he looked over his shoulder and thought, who are you laughing at? I was like, oh, no, I'm just having a good time, mate. <laughs> <laughs> just like that, grinning away, just rolling. Just goes happy to be yeah, there. I was just no. staring off into space. And yeah, it's definitely good fun. 100%. What does the actual structure of the grading look like? Is it like, you know, what do you need to, to do to, to achieve your belt? Yeah, your so there's like the, the pattern is like the main thing. We then have sort of progressions towards self-defense. So we have what we call set, step sparring. Uh, so we have like a three step sparring, two step sparring, one step sparring, and then it's sort of built into free sparring and self-defense. Uh, the board breaking is a big part from sort of blue belt onwards. They do the, the power testing that we call it. Uh, and then self-defense elements. So they have like the, you know, escaping from grabs and pins and things. Nice. Um, but again, you, normally you only see the, the sparring side of things. So that's sort of more appealing to watch. Mm. But yeah, there, there's a, there is a self-defense element to it. Uh, and part of the reason I got involved in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu myself is one, I wanted a, a hobby outside of the taekwondo but also to end help the self-defense element of the taekwondo mm. you know you can stand up and punch and kick and then you do hit the deck because you're not as good as you thought you were hopefully you have a few elements that like keep yourself safe mm. on your back how was that transition what? being a world champion taekwondo guy going into jiu-jitsu to get my ass handed to me all the time <laughs> it's, it's humbling but that's good again i'm never against that like yeah getting beat up's good for you isn't did it? you think you <laughs> did you think at the time like you you were going to be fine and then um or did you so, know Another reason I got into the jiu-jitsu is one of the groups we were part of was an American group. And they were very sort of self-defense and very rounded. So they actually had a lot of, I don't, I don't think necessarily the jiu-jitsu techniques were the best standard, but it piqued my interest in, in grappling. I'm like, oh, this yeah. is quite cool. I like this ground fighting. So we had it within, within our, uh, within a Taekwondo association. It was part of their ground fighting, was part of their self-defense curriculum. Right. So I had a, like a, a very, very fundamental understanding yeah. but no I still got my ass handed to me you know a few of the blue belts <laughs> just beat me up and rough me up and but yeah it was, it was for me it was humbling good to be at the bottom you know be at the bottom of the pile and start to rebuild and you know yeah yeah jiu jitsu is a, it's a humbling sport mm, yeah definitely what, with, with the with the black belts in jiu jitsu obviously it's done on a time thing so getting your black belts fucking hard yeah. it takes forever um and then once you get there, though, um, obviously you, I guess you would need to demonstrate some level of training, but it's kind of then that the, the, the stripes are kind of done on a time thing. So yep. it sort of, I think, starts to three years for the first couple and then up to five, I think, or maybe vice versa. Once you're a black belt in Taekwondo, is it the same thing or do you need to continue yeah, to grade and demonstrate? Yeah, technique? you have to continue and grade and demonstrate until your seventh degree, which is then classed as the master grade. So that's about, yeah, so I'm... I've, I'm due to do my seventh degree grading in the next 18 months or so. So yeah. they only run the, the high gradings at international events. Um, but yeah, so for ease, it's not, it's not strictly this way, but from first degree to second degree is two years, second, third, three, it's sort of is around about that. So it's actually a year less on most grades. But yeah, if you just imagine it's going to be about whichever grade you're testing for next is that many years for the belt. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's not... It's, like, yeah, it's, actually, it's a long time to stay in something, isn't it? Yeah, it almost it almost sounds like in in some way then the seventh degree black belt is almost like the black belt equivalent to jiu jitsu. It could be, it could be. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean that's thirty years of training. Though. I've not, I've done, okay. I've trained taekwondo for like yeah, thirty not. years solid. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, so it's could, could you have done it any quicker or not? No. Okay. No fourth fourth degree black belt. I'd say is the equivalent okay. to sort of the jiu jitsu um, black belt, really. Yeah. And that's classes international. They have these weird titles, but international instructor is at fourth degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah that's that's a good solid 10 12 years plus training mm -hmm. to get to that level it's a long yeah. time it's a long <laughs> yeah. time it's a yeah. long time 
you know those dance moves really well by that point. Yeah, right? so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know how to, you know how to shake those hips. Eh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're all good dancers. As you talk on there. <laughs> so obviously, get into that level of black belt. So for your style of grading, do you have to kind of like win or be successful in sparring? No, no, no. Okay, fine. Yeah, it's just you, you do the patterns and all the, yeah. the disciplines and the elements. So yeah, there's a physical grading all the way up to se up to seventh degree. So my, my last one will be my last physical grading. And then for the last basically two, it's done based on things given back to Taekwondo. Um, and a lot of years as well, you know, it'll be like from yeah, my seventh degree to eighth degree will be about seven years minimum. Okay. And then eight years for the following grade minimum. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll be yeah, I'll yeah. be in my fifties by that. Point. What what is the max? What, what no, ninth degree is the the highest grade in in, in Taekwondo. Yeah, and America has a few tenth degrees, but you know America make your own <laughs> just make your own shit up. Yeah, they? Pretty, yeah. pretty much, they just yeah. Sorry, mate. Just keep going. And supreme, just put your own stripes on eleven, yeah. ten, eleven. A supreme super grandmaster sort of level <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah. So ninth is the highest. Um, but, you know, we, to be honest, like, the older you get, the worse you get at the sport as well. Yeah. You know, I'm nowhere near as good as I was when I was in my, like, 20s. Like, now I just feel old and slow. And, yeah. Um, but, do, again, start to do it for different reasons as well. You know, do it, do it to give back. Mm -hmm. And also, for me, like, the next generation of guys coming through training, that's my sort of – to make their experience better than what mine was is this yeah. sort of key goal. Yeah, that's good, mate. I feel like that would probably be the case more so in something like Taekwondo versus Jiu-Jitsu. Um, but like in jiu-jitsu, obviously, you know, a younger athletic guy will, you know, sort of overcome you if they've got similar technique. Yep. But I think there's, there's you know, you, you can select technique and movement in jiu-jitsu because it's it's so vast yep. that would suit like an older... You can play your game, can't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing that drew me, drew me to jiu-jitsu as well. You can literally play your own game. It's like, oh, I can now get smashed in half guard for forever yeah. I want to instead. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's... um. Yeah, whereas with the competition taekwondo, is is you know, I keep talking about the, the competition because it's the thing that I'm passionate about. Yeah, there's a definite style that having that flexibility and the mobility in your hips to still kick is is paramount. If you can't can't do it, you're going to struggle. Yeah. yeah. So tell us more about your jiu-jitsu journey then, mate. So you started that nine years ago. Nine years ago, yeah, traveling down to Cornwall, yeah. uh, training with Rafael de Santos. Um, is he still around? I've not had his name for years. I don't years. think so. I know mean, he went. So he, on the story, so from there we set up a club with a, another purple belt called Andy Medcalf. Uh, he emigrated to New Zealand and Raf disappeared to uh, Dubai. I then started training with Luke Costello mm -hmm. uh, for a good portion of time. Um, Luke then stopped teaching and then started working under, or training under Kenny. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the journey so far and some, yeah, it's been, it's been good. Yeah, and how many Jiu Jitsu students have you got? Uh, we're probably about 20, 30. It's, it's pretty small at the moment. Okay. Uh, like I said, I, I personally honestly did jiu-jitsu for a hobby. I never had any intention of actually running it. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I just wanted to, to learn this this cool art that was sort of been raved about all over the country, all over the world. Like, I need to get get into this. Mm. And then, yeah, um, couldn't train locally. The, the club didn't want me to train, I think, because I was a rival martial arts club. So that they didn't allow me to train initially. And then start training with Raf through a Taekwondo colleague who said, I've oh, got one of the best guys in the world. You know, I think he was multiple world champion or something in his in the masters category, um, and not knowing I was driving past some amazing talent in Luke Costello and Kenny <laughs> Baker. It's like this is this is crazy, um, and yeah, just like I said competed as a white belt, won won a different category as a white belt, and then did a couple as a blue belt, early blue belts. So got my ass handed to me pretty badly, um, and then just yeah, I sort of we had sort of the COVID the COVID gap between that and I've not really done much since to be honest I'm competing wise just focusing on the club and yeah growing it from there yeah because I think that was probably the last time we rolled wasn't it probably before the pandemic yeah just before the pandemic yeah I used to try and get down every Friday to train train at Kenny's and then yeah and what, when, when, when was I doing the class down there was that a, was that a, a Friday daytime Friday Friday maybe it's midday yeah, yeah Friday morning so it was morning you guys for me to leave for, you? to come down yeah that's right yeah <laughs> and um you mentioned uh, just a second ago about how jiu-jitsu has kind of changed your perspective on uh, how you grade. Yep. Has it changed your perspective in regard to kind of martial arts and combat at, at all outside of that? Not really. Um, no, I mean, I think, again, like I said, I, I'm a big believer in that all martial arts do have value. It's just mm. who trains you, how they apply it, you know, like kicking and kicking, punching and punching, it, it does all work. Um, and then even with the jiu-jitsu, I mean, I remember training years ago, uh, like a little low white uh, blue belt struggling 
and we were on like a slant and I couldn't do any of my sweeps that I had available to me because he was downhill and I needed to sweep him uphill and I was sort of <laughs> pinned. I couldn't get the underhook to shoot to my knees. I'm like, damn, I'm stuck. Like jujitsu is good if it's on a nice flat matted area. You put, put it why on we, Why were you training on a slope? Uh, it was, it's, we have like a run at annual summer camp. So we're training in a field somewhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was amazing. It really made me realize like there's, you know, you get pinned against a cage wall or something. Yeah. All of a sudden your game reduces quite dramatically. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's all good. You know, I, I personally, I, I, I try not to slander any martial art, even though you yeah. know, there's me been doing that to the Olympic style taekwondo in this, <laughs> this conversation. But, you know, it, like I said, it's, I think it's all good. It like, adds a lot of value to you. We're all, mm. you know, the amount of people we have come through to the club that just get freaked out by trying, you know, hugging another man and getting close to them, it freaks them out. So if you have a stand up martial art, it's more for them, you know, it's my favourite part of the day. Yeah, it keeps it. Why it keeps coming. <laughs> it's the struggle cuddles. The struggle cuddles are fun, aren't they? So despite the fact you just said that, I, I need to ask, if you were in a street fight situation yep. against maybe an untrained assailant, but a bit of a lump, yep. would you rather have taekwondo or jiu-jitsu if you'd only have one? So in the very few situations I've had, I've actually, it's a 50-50 split. I this big, huge guy, it was a Christmas pie who came out and my missus just dropped us off, just got the money out. A guy got thrown out of a pub. I was with one of my students who's massive and this big dude just came out and went straight for him because he'd, he'd been thrown out of the pub. I just threw a big overhand right, cracked him straight in the head and knocked him out. So that, that was that sorted. And another situation was a, a chap started attacking a guy, double legged him and then put him into a Kimura. The interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing with the Jiu Jitsu thing is like, um, I'm sober and I, I can't break his arm, this is bad. And I had that guilt feeling. It was like, yeah. what do I do now? I'm now stuck with a guy underneath me, do I know? <laughs> so I told him that just walk off, go away and let him off and let him run away. Yeah, okay. Who then gobbed off down the road saying, come on then, <laughs> standard <laughs> practice. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm going to need an answer, I'm mate. I'm going to need an answer. <laughs> I'm not letting you wiggle out of the yeah. stories. <laughs> I'm going to go with Jits now. Okay. Getting older. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's, it's, there's, you can close the gap easier, pin them, mm. and then, yeah, play your game from there. Yeah, okay. But rolling's pretty disgusting on concrete. That guy, double leg, my knee the next day was in pieces. Yeah, and I think that's often the argument, is it? When, when you've got, you know, sort of people out there that maybe don't value jujitsu in a street fight. Yeah. Especially sort of, I guess, the the less traditional style of jiu-jitsu where you don't think about striking so much. Yeah. It, again, I think it's that closing the distance, distance management, and also, you know, going to the ground with somebody yeah, yeah. as your only option. Obviously, yeah. you don't have that as an only option, but I think for some people they do. Yeah. I think that's always the argument. You know, like you say, if you double leg someone, you're going to break your knee. If they've got a mate and you're on the deck, they're going to boot you in the head. 100%. So, but I, but I think doing a lot of, you know, any martial art you say is going to give you a level of awareness, isn't it? That's it, yeah. yeah. You fight most days, don't you? Yeah. yeah. You grapple yeah. most days. Your awareness of your own body yeah. against someone who's never fucking done it, you, the, the level is so, so yeah. far apart. Isn't it? Mm. Is it, what's that, what's that big dude called? Is it Bradley Martin or whatever? <laughs> yeah. Who keeps calling out all these UFC fucking fighters? Yeah. It, he, he's got to realise, like, even someone who's half his fucking weight, they're yeah. going to fuck him up if he's have never you, been on the map. Have you seen this guy? I haven't, no. So oh. he's just some big YouTuber, but he's about 260, just a big bodybuilder. And basically everybody interviews who does some sort of combat sport or martial arts like yeah. so uh, you could beat me in a street fight <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah but um who's it sean strickland said if you ask me that, i'm gonna get up and i'm gonna punch him straight in the fucking nose yeah <laughs> you fucking would <laughs> yeah well. no, would. No, we asked nate diaz he, then nate diaz did nate, you can so. see nate looking at him though can you but, but, but i think he just he, i think nate just found it so ridiculous he was like <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's like you're a, he, then he just go you're a youtuber yeah <laughs> <laughs> gotta watch Podcaster. out look what's happened with jake paul you know he's holding his own pretty well yeah he's not he's not a youtuber anymore mate he's, he's, not, a, he's a boxer now yeah he's, he's the thing is when you've got that much resource yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%, yeah. and you're, you're a young athletic guy and you can just put all the money yeah. into the best training all the time in the world and then take three years doing it you're going to be fucking mustard aren't you against yeah, yeah. a lot of certainly yeah. a lot of other either ex grappling I don't understand why they pigeonhole people sometimes you know they, they look at even someone like Anthony Joshua who didn't start boxing until he was like 18 yeah you know look at Jake Paul he's only a little bit older when he started but because he was famous before that, it's like, oh no, he can't, he can't be good at that because he was good at, you know, YouTube. Yeah, 100%. I just don't understand it. Like you said, he's got all the money in the world. He can pay for the best trainers, best facilities, best sparring partners, whatever he fucking wants. You know, mm. you're going to be better, aren't you? You're going to be fucking And reduce good. that learning process down because you've got the, the money. A, in a huge amount. Yeah. yeah. Usually, yeah. Okay, same question. Different, <laughs> different opponent. Right. So this time the assailant is a trained opponent. Right. And they've got hands. Okay. So they can, they can, they can throw down. In that scenario, what would you rather have? If they're, yeah, I'm going to be taking them down. They're going, yeah. Jiu-Jitsu yeah. again? I think so. Okay. 
and you'd feel confident not having any striking that you could get hold of them. I hope so. Yeah, you know, I guess you never know. That's well, a big hope. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if they can throw hands and you've got to try and get in and close that gap, it's not always, again, if they're really training. Of yeah. course, you know, you look at the UFC nowadays, yeah. of course, fights go to the floor, but it's not as, you know, back in the early, like UFC ones and twos that, you know, always taking everyone down and finishing yeah. them. Nowadays, fights step a lot more frequently. Yeah, but that's that's good takedown defense as well. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, people talk about wrestling, this and that, but part of wrestling is, is sprawling, take, yep. you know, stuff in those takedowns, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So uh, someone on the street ain't going to know how to fucking do that, even if they can punch. I, I guess for me, but I'm like, you never know who they are. Yeah. So I just say pretty humble and I was chill say, out. yeah. I know, I was, I was like, anything I've won in the past, I've run that in a taekwondo, you know, I've, it's in my little rule set that I'm like, was good at. Outside of that, street fighting is different. Like, mm. Just stay humble, like chill out. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Don't let your ego get too That's far ahead it. of you. So no thanks to you. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so but maybe I'll just walk away. See you later. Yeah. All right. And one more scenario. <laughs> you against a karate guy. <laughs> against Steve, he's an animal. <laughs> maybe not Steve. But <laughs> Steve don't count because he is a bit fucking, he's a bit tasty, but... Yeah. Like full on as in a self-defense scenario or a yeah like set, just if you no rules <laughs> no rules karate versus taekwondo he's winning kumite kumite yeah I mean the he's basically asking do you think taekwondo, taekwondo is better, is better than karate, karate yeah personally I think taekwondo is better I think it's more dynamic but saying that training with, with Steve at some of the Royal Navy training weeks that we do yeah. uh, if there was a show to can karate club in my area when I was doing it it's very similar to Taekwondo yeah. they, but they have sweeps and trips which we don't have like we, I've got no skill set in that in, in, in that form so I guess you could argue that makes it more rounded um, nice. but the way in which they strike is different like I said it's more that point stop they hit retract on the same line whereas yeah. we have more of a a you know, the kickboxing side of things so when we have actually trained together at at the Royal Navy Training Week, Steve and I, and I've trained with the karate guys, they may score the first point, which if they hit me really hard, could be bad. But after that, we then continue going and they're always a bit standoffish. Um, that's just, again, my, my experience. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, I guess if they hit me first hard, I'm, I could be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I could be sleeping. Yeah, um, same could be said about a lot of things. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. In MMA, like high-level MMA, like sort of UFC, um, are there any sort of good taekwondo practitioners in that I can't really think I don't know if Stephen Thompson is he cray or so he is yeah of... point stop karate I believe yeah okay I, I could be wrong on that he could have a traditional background and I would say the point so you think of people like um, Raymond Daniels or um, Michael Venom Page they're all sort of points kickboxing the mm. taekwondo style of sparring currently is similar to that mm. but it doesn't stop um, so you know those the point stop guys are phenomenal at distance control and they know how to close a gap quickly smother you and then disengage out um so yeah, there's not, I mean, I think Conor McGregor did it at Taekwondo, there's some footage of him training in the ITF club in, in Ireland mm. at some point. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know strictly, thought of, there was a few. Yeah. What's, um, what's his name? The uh, Barboza, is he Taekwondo? He he's may, got a lot of very yeah, he's quick spin attacks. He's got yeah. some good kicks. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100 sure if he is yeah, okay. Taekwondo, but he's got a, a, definitely a good kicking arsenal. He's, mm. he's phenomenal. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy in the old school, UFC ones and twos at the Taekwondo. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> those are fucking old. Yes, yeah, the old, old wild, like UFC they? one. They were like, wild. <laughs> he didn't look very Taekwondo, to be honest. He just looked yeah. like a massive juice head. But you know, yeah. you know, take the take the credit. It says Taekwondo needs. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Yeah. No, I was I wasn't sure. I, I wanted to ask. Um, and then obviously we talked about obviously Taekwondo being watered down a little bit in places, and obviously Jiu Jitsu may well go that way. Who knows? Um, but there's a lot of like bullshit martial arts around. Yeah. What's your thoughts on some of the shit you see online? That's horrendous. Um, yeah. P uh, people should do more research when they join a club. Mm. Like a hundred percent. Don't just because there's a special offer. I mean, I, I'm because of those sort of clubs that are very good at the marketing, but have very low value in regards to what they teach as martial arts. They're very good at the business side of things. And I'm like, this is horrendous. So I got good at marketing on purpose because I was fed up of seeing these guys that were, you know, they were teaching just basically shocking rubbish mm. um, yeah no I'm not there's loads of them there's loads of like, cowboys and again this is why with the governing bodies and stuff I, we're part of all the main governing bodies it gives you some sort of legitimacy yeah. like UK BGA Association you know the, mm. we're part of WACO for the kickboxing yeah. it holds you to some sort of standard uh, but because martial arts is so unregulated people can just like you said open up a school I don't want to say any names but there's a few that just pop up in areas and just they're just a franchise to make money for the top mm. guy mm -hmm. uh, but what they teach is pretty poor 
Yeah. So if someone was looking to, to do Taekwondo, I think you kind of answered it mostly there in a way, but what, what is the advice about finding a good school? I mean, most schools will give a free trial, go and try it out, um, check out if they are part of a governing body, you know, so in the Taekwondo is the British Taekwondo Council mm. is sort of the, the main overarching governing body. For me personally, the ITF and ITF style of Taekwondo, uh, as we were saying, so offline, there's lots of different groups called the ITF. It doesn't actually mean they are ITF. So just do a bit of due diligence, have a little look into it, go try out the club. But I guess at the end of the day, as long as you enjoy the club and the training, it doesn't matter about the associations. The more you train, the more you'll learn. Um, but yeah, just make sure that I guess maybe the belts mean something. They have some sort of yeah. link to a credible lineage as it would be. Because um, sadly, yeah, there's a lot of business martial arts schools that standards are shocking. Yeah, yeah now there is. I mean, yeah, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's for someone who, who has no idea about martial arts or fighting and they go into a school and like you say, the market is good. Even if it all seems nice. Yeah if the actual what they're being taught is nonsense, then it could end really badly for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot yeah. of false, false information can be passed through. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, um, it's, but yeah, people just need to do some more research, I think, personally. Mm -hmm. Don't just join a club because you saw it on Facebook, which is been saying that, that's how we market and that's how <laughs> I market. I'm saying that. But yeah, but I guess through doing their, yeah, their due diligence, checking it all out, making sure everything's legit, you know, checking, yeah, I think like what groups they're part of will be a big indicator. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's it really. Yeah, fair enough. And the last thing I wanted to ask was, was around, I guess, like mental health, because that's one of our old, overarching yeah, sort yeah. of topics on this. And we've talked loads about jujitsu and, you know, whether it's just the, the level of intensity that you can compete at, the, the vastness of, of, the, of the learning and the skill acquisition, you know, the hugging, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, it seems to be really, really effective for, for helping people with mental health. Um, obviously, real charities like that use it as a vehicle with veterans. Yeah. Um, obviously you do bits in the Navy as well, so you may see kind of, you know, aspects of it there, but do you find that Taekwondo has a similar sort of power or strength around mental health? I really do believe, yeah, I think yeah. it does. I think Brazilian Jiu Jitsu currently is massively popular. It's the, it's the hot martial art to do. Yeah. But like back in the 80s, 90s, Taekwondo did that. And I think, it, you know, all martial arts have that ability to focus on something a bit cheesy like focusing your mind just even just working out you know we know that doing sports and fitness is going to help relieve those, release those endorphins and make you feel better about yourself so just getting involved and doing something but i think with the martial arts you have that community as well um so like is it yeah all martial arts have that just jujitsu super you know it's a hot topic in the moment everyone's doing it so mm. yeah but if it, i guess if it makes people if they don't like jujitsu for whatever reason they don't like the the hugging element it's too close try a different martial art and give yeah. it a try yeah i think that, that club's a big one isn't it yeah the club yeah. squat position club of any martial art 100 so, yeah. perfect i feel a little bit better about taekwondo now yeah yeah, I feel like I need to apologise for some no, of my other comments. <laughs> Sometimes I feel the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I get those exact same feelings and because it's the art that I do love doing to see people sort of bastardise it as it is. It's like, oh, you're not helping me at all. Guys. <laughs> you're not helping me. But, um, but yeah, I think yeah, you find something that you enjoy doing. You know, I've been doing it for 30 years. I must love something about it. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. 100%, mate. Yeah, anything else you want to no, cover, Anything else yeah. you want to mention, mate, before we wrap up? All I can think of. Oh, no, man. Thanks for coming on, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Cheers, mate.